Okay. So here's uh, just comments on calibration. Um, so we've seen this kind of whirlwind examination of parameter variation experiment conceptually, or, or excuse me, the need for sensitivity analyses. And we've seen two types of sensitive analysis be operationalized, one over stochastics and one over as we change parameter values. This examine this enterprise of examining model sensitivity to, to uncertainty is a it's a critical one. It's a really important one. It's hard to get a paper published without some sort of sensitivity analysis. Because the reviewers want to know how contingent are your results on the the happenstance, you know, of what the random number generated ha happened to give or of the particular parameter values you put in. Will all hell break loose if you change those, change your assumption? Will your findings be very, very different? But beyond that, there's another sphere in which parameter estimation intersects with, at a certain level, with the matter of model uncertainty. And, that's, and that has to do with techniques that seek to find out estimates for parameter values that are not well known, where there is uncertainty by comparing model emergent behavior with empirical data sets. Because we said from this very room within the past two days that models are not, are very different. Dynamic models are very different from decision trees or other traditional structures which take data in and require those assumptions and give output, but where that output is not itself comparable to real world data sources. It just results from those out, from those inputs. With dynamic models, we can compare what results from a model with other empirical data in the world. And we can use that to refine our assumptions. We can use it to cross-check our assumptions. And I argued here on Monday, no, no less, on in the morning on Monday, that we can use this ability for models for us to not only not only scrutinize model structure to critique it and advance it, but model output. We can compare it against observed data. We can compare it against people's direct experience and use that to improve a model. In this whole process of kind of using model output by comparison with real world data to refine our understanding about the model is itself a large enterprise, it's itself a big area. And the most widespread and basic form of that is something called calibration. But I will note that it's, 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 it has many threads of connection to areas of uh, statistical filtering traditions, um, estimate sampling, uh, sampling estimates from parameters from distributions in Bayesian type fashions, and approximations thereof, like uh, approximate uh, Bayesian computation. And we don't have time to talk about this, but I, I've taught classes where videos are online about this, this whole set of techniques. Um, using them with dynamic models. Calibration, this one over here, um, uh, you know, seeks to arrive at, and to some degree privilege, um, sort of the values about certain other model quantities that lead the model to best match in its observed emergent behavior, the data from the world. So maybe we have coming out of the model data produced from the model as output that at some level can be compared with data from the world. That data coming out of the model can't be typically reduced to any one 
parameter assumption, but rather we adjust the values of parameter assumptions that are less well known so that this data coming out of the model, which happens to have empirical analogs that happens to be able to be compared with data from the world, that we, we arrive at assumptions about those unknown model parameters that yield the best match. And those that assumption is not guaranteed to be correct, but at least it um, uh, at least it allows us to cross check whether the model can match that data from the world, and it gives us plausible guesses if it if it does. So the fact that models put out empirical data, or excuse me, put out quantities lead to emergent properties that can be compared with real world data gives us great tools for adjusting, for challenging model structure, finding out if it's adequate fit for the task, and if it is for adjusting assumption about parameter values. So calibration helps us leverage this large amount of data we have from the world that cannot be used directly to estimate any one parameter. Rather, it can be used to inform to cross-check assumptions about model structure and parameter values, to challenge the model, and if the model is proves worthy in terms of ability to account for it, to inform an understanding of parameter values. So how does calibration in its most basic form work? Well, it adjusts model assumptions about model parameters that are not well known such that the model results get closer and closer to what we see empirically. And it uses a technique called optimization to do that. So we try to hone in on parameter values to zero in. So the idea is we change assumptions about parameters, maybe here, beta, mu, and tau, these, these three parameters. Um, maybe one is birth rate, maybe, well, one is contact rate, one is transmission probability, and one is related to, um, you know, people, the reporting rate for people in the population who get sick. And these three parameters, as we vary them, the model results will change. And we're trying to find the value for beta, for mu, and for tau, the point in this cube. We try to explore this cube and figure out the point that leads the model's output to best match what we see empirically. Um, and this requires a bunch of information. Um, what parameters you want to vary over what range, how you want to do the optimization, and what things you're going to match against empirical data. So you have to figure out what outputs from the model get mapped to what empirical data. And and then you're going to have to have some way of quantifying how good is the fit of the model for, for, for each parameter value. You get output and you compare it against corresponding data from the world. How good is that match? So a discrepancy function. And there's arguments for designing these discrepancy functions in principled ways that meet some, some criteria. So the idea here is, and, and this is work with Wade and, and others, like from our pertussis model, you know, seeking to match data from the world in, in terms of yearly, uh, this is a distribution of yearly incidents. This is age distribution. Uh, this is an autocorrelation function. Um, this is vaccination coverage. And the model's trying to match all of these simultaneously, the mean incidence of infection. We could look at model contact patterns that come out of the model that are generated by the model and compare that to, to corresponding data we have from the world, from studies of contact patterns um, through surveys of contact patterns. These come out of the model in ways that are generated by the model. They can't be told to the model, but we sure as want the model to match what we do know about contacts. It may have to make lots of other little assumptions about other aspects of, of the, the context, but at least what can be compared empirically, we want to watch to give the model face, face plausibility. Um, 
So this is this is what calibration seeks to do. And I want to refer you here to a example model called SIR HF based calibration. If you go to the example models, help example models, scroll down, SIR agent based calibration. Here we go. And I'd like you here to right click on calibration and to run it. And what you will see is an attempt of a model to be calibrated. So it's it's seeking to calibrate a model. This is the historic data against which it will calibrate. Generally, we have many types of empirical data. Commonly, we'll have many simultaneous ones that we're trying to match. And I, I thought I had a, well, yeah, it's, it's like this one earlier we saw. Um, uh, this one, uh, this one, here, we're trying to match all of these simultaneously. After all, the model has many outputs. We can match them all against corresponding empirical data if we have it, if we're so lucky to have it. So here, we're going to run the model, and we'll see the current output from the model and the best one thus far. And it's trying to run the model. That's what you see it doing in parallel. It's running many copies of the model in parallel. And it will be graphing here uh, when it finishes. And it's interesting that it's taking a while here. Um, that's that's interesting. Wait, any it, it needs more memory. Okay, thank you. Um, that was one of my hypotheses, okay. Oh, I just closed, no, I didn't close any of mine. Okay, yes, you're right, out of memory error, okay. Okay, so let's go give it more memory. I remember this, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna give it 512 megabytes instead of 128. Okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. It's trying different things. It's groping around. It's trying to match it as best it can. Recognizing that each run has some stochastics. So, oh, it, it got a pretty decent match. And here, this is a measure of its discrepancy. How close is it? Matter? You want lower is better. And you can see it's learning over time. It's finding areas of assumptions about the parameters that allow a, a more plausible match. They get it closer to the empirical data. And it's honing in, it's honing in, it's learning from each of those data points. Some of them are real duds. But some are getting that ring of truth, or, or at least ring of plausibility, I'd say. And it's getting closer and closer, closer and closer to this best match data. And you notice as it's doing that, it's adjusting its assumption about parameter rate. Some high values, some low. This is the best thus far. The best thus far has been a, a um, um, an objective function value. In other words, a discrepancy value of 243 now, and it gets better occasionally. It finds an even better one. Wow. And there's a whole art to using past results to try to hone in. There's a trade-off between, between uh, exploitation of results you've already found that are really good versus exploration of areas you haven't yet explored, but it's learning. It's learning about what's a better and better, more plausible range of parameter values. You may have noticed, I don't know if you saw it, if, if, if I were to start this again, right now this graph is going from about, you know, the lowest one is 130 up to about 2000. When we started here, when we started off, excuse me, when we started off, It was way up here, like seventeen hundred, right? Um, and in fact, oh, here's one at twenty uh, above, uh, about two thousand. Yeah. Um. So, it it gets better and better. It gets more savvy. It finds ones that are better and better accounting. But of course, generally, it's doing this for many types of output at once. Because from a given model, we can output many things. 
And if we're fortunate, we can pick many that can be compared with empirical data. And we want it to face plausibility across all that type of data. But the truth is, it's not just a mechanical process. It's not just a, an optimization. It's a learning process used properly. So as you're doing this, you should be looking for opportunities to learn why is it, why is it that it's having problems? What's confusing it? What is challenging it? What, why is there a tension between matching this one or that one? When you can match A well, but B suffers, or B well and A suffers, why is that? Is there something we need to learn about model structure that's being whispered to us here? Is there something about other parameters we've taken as given that need to be questioned? And of course, we have to reflect the fact that models, as we run them many times, we may get somewhat different results. So you'll find videos of me. If anyone's interested in this, you'll find videos of me talking about ways to undertake this, talking about principles for it, ways of learning from it, and by using systematic experimentation to, to learn better and better from these empirical results and responding to challenges it has. And you're gonna be looking, maybe there's not one unique way of doing it. Okay, um, I could talk about particle filtering, but time, time is really running out and we're in the most grievous of triage. So that was just a, a sampler, a tempter to, to learn more. Um, I'm going